Woo. <laughs> I'm going to start over. Let's just try that again. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's why they say, look where you're walking. Don't be on your phone while you're driving. That's why, right there. Accidents happen, guys. If we're not aware of it, <laughs> it's going to get bad. <laughs> good morning. How's everyone doing today? I was doing pretty good until I tripped on my face. That was fantastic. So... <laughs> I'm all flustered now. This is going to be fun. All right. Good morning. <laughs> if you're a visitor with us today, uh, please see our bulletin. We do have a QR code for you to be able to get all of your visitor information filled out. Um, those QR codes are great, aren't they? Amazing. It throws it right into a system. We can get all your information and be in contact with you. So that is just amazing. Uh, we do have our prayer cards also attached to our bulletins, and we'll ask for those a little bit later in the service. So if you have a specific prayer request, please fill those out so that we can get those prayed for. On our announcements this morning, we do have the honor of having Dr. Martin Taylor with us this morning. Who's excited? I'm excited. It's going to be a great message. We're very much looking forward to it. On February, oh, is it already past that? Oh, goodness gracious. February 12th, we have our Texas Church of God Facebook Live event, which is going to be in replacement of our winter prayer conference. So we encourage everybody, please log on and join that. It's going to be an awesome time. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Brother Hill is speaking. So that is going to be a great time. Also on February 12th at 7 to 10, we're going to have our first elders training. Uh, I know that there are lots of people who are excited for that, and I'm excited for that to see where we're going to move into with our new elders. Uh, February 13th will be our second tier of elders training. If you don't show up to the first one, you probably shouldn't show up to the second one. But uh, And then on February 14th is Valentine's Day, but for us, it's more importantly, pack a pew Sunday. So remember, pastor said that the family that brings the most of their family and their close friends and packs them in on their pew will be receiving a gift. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be taking people to lunch. I'd be like, ha, 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 I got you here. Y'all have to pay now. <laughs> That's just me, though. <laughs> So at this time, the children, you are dismissed. I know that Ethan and Sister Cynthia are very much looking forward to having a good service with you this morning. On Tuesday, we had our Facebook Live prayer service. And I read a verse that had been on my mind for a few days. And let me tell you, who knows that when God asks you, when you ask God to do something, like when you pray for patience, what's God going to do? He's going to test your faith. He's going to test your patience. And what did I do on Tuesday? I prayed for peace. So what did God do? He said, okay, I'm going to test you. Let's see how much you can handle this week. And my week went from here and just went. <laughs> and it was, it was an awful, awful week. But at the end of the day, every day, this verse popped into my head. And the verse is, it's in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And it says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So every day I was constantly reminded, yeah, stuff's going to happen. Yeah, you're going to mess up. Yeah, you're going to trip on your face on the stage in front of people. But I'm there for you. And if you believe in me, my joy will flow through you. So I just am so excited to be here this morning, to be able to have the opportunity to worship him and allow that joy to enter into my life. Amen? 
God, we thank you for giving us the opportunity this morning to come to you. And we are so thankful that you allow us to come here and worship you freely, God. We cannot wait to see how you're going to move in this service and how you're going to move in this year, Father. We thank you and we honor you. And we look so forward to being in your presence, God. In your name, amen. Worshippers, right? We have a reason to worship you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mighty grace, God, for your great love that you have poured out for us on Calvary, God. There is nothing that compares to your great love, God. And we worship, we magnify and exalt your holy name, and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus.
precious son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for that relationship that we can have with you, Jesus, every day. Lord, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for your faithfulness and your grace, God, your loving kindness, Lord Jesus. Through every battle, through every heartbreak.
Every breath I am able, every breath I will sing of the goodness of God. Every breath, not the breaths on Sundays and Wednesdays, not the breaths when I'm feeling happy that day. Every breath, when we're in those times where we can hardly see where we're going, every breath will be praising him every breath. God, I thank you so much that you allow us to live on this earth and praise you with every breath that we have. We love you so much, God. And we are so thankful that you have given us the opportunity to praise you with every breath. No matter what our situation is, no matter what is happening, we are able to praise you for who you are and for how great you are and how awesome you are. We love you, Father, and we're so thankful that you love us. At this time, if you would bring your prayer requests forward. Join with me as we pray for these prayers. God, we know that you know everything that's on these cards, God. And we know that you have every situation in your hands. And we are so glad that you are the way that you are. Because all we have to do is ask. All we have to do is ask, God. So, God, I pray for the prayers that are on these cards right now, God. You know what each of them are. And you have every need what it needs. It may not be what we think it needs, but it's what you know it needs. Thank you, Father. We love you, Father. You may be seated. Would you give the Lord a clap off of praise? He is worthy. Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. These prayer cards, uh, we ask that you, if you will, take one uh, for the next seven days, pray over it. We pray over these for seven days after we pray over them here. So if you are a prayer warrior, intercessor, please pick one of those up on your way out and uh, pray over it over the next seven days and intercede on behalf of those needs and requests. You still believe in the power of prayer? Yeah. Amen. God answers prayer. Praise the Lord. God is so good. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord. Turn to somebody and say, it's good to see you today. We're glad you could join with us together and, and worship, in worship. And uh, aren't you thankful for the goodness of God? He has been watching over us all our lives. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I want to show you a video that was sent to us uh, by Dr. Tim Hill. So they're going to turn the lights down. Make sure the sound is on from the beginning. And uh, Dr. Hill, I think he sent these out to uh, several different churches. But he sent one to us and I wanted to show it to you, so at this time they're going to show that.
Hello, Kurt. Let me take a couple of seconds here before we transition to the video that's been prepared and attached to this one and just say to you how much I love and appreciate you and your family and all the Lord is doing through you in Mansfield, Texas at the Great Walnut Creek Church. I've got to get back and make up that date we had to cancel because of COVID-19, but I commend you and celebrate you and look forward to being with you again. Thank you, Kurt, for being a part of the great ministry team in Texas. See you soon. God bless. Hello, Kurt. Let me step up. Any other time, appreciate you. Preach more gospel to more people than at any other time in our history. And I want you to hear me say thank you. This video is not about me making an announcement. It's not about me giving any kind of promotion that I'm going to invite you to be a part of. It's just simply about me saying from one heart to another, I really appreciate you. And I appreciate your state leaders, Toby and Diane Morgan, how they have so creatively stepped up and with great innovation, they have communicated with you. And you have not slacked at all in sharing the gospel and helping to finish the Great Commission. You know, there's a lot about this season I don't understand and I don't even begin to know. But there's one thing I do know. I know that the God who knows the end from the beginning and everything in between, he's got you and me in the palm of his hands. And I still lean heavily today on Jeremiah 29 and 11, where the word of God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts to do you good and not evil to give you a hope and a future. One rendition of that says to bring you to an expected end. In other words, God's not going to be at all surprised by your victory and your success. So, Pastor, I just want you to hear me say today, the Church of God Executive Committee prayed for you today. Every week, we select a state, and we call the names of those pastors in that state in prayer. And we did that for you today. And I can't wait until I can come home again and share fellowship with the people that raised me, literally. I love you so much. I look forward to our time to be together. But until then, let's just keep being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that makes a difference in this world. We are indeed the church on mission. God bless. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. The second half of that was more geared towards you. The first little snippet was to, to Gina and I, but the second half was to you, to encourage you. And when he said a place where he was raised, I, I do have to say that uh, Brother Speedy grew up with him. Isn't that right? He, he, he uh, grew up with Dr. Hill, and um, many of you know him, and we are working on getting him to come this year. He's supposed to have been here last year, but COVID-19 happened, and he was unable to come, and we weren't actually having services when he was scheduled to come. So uh, we're looking forward to getting him to be able to come in and be with us um, later on this year. I want you to um, prepare your hearts for giving. And in just a moment, we're going to ask you to come and worship the Lord in your giving and the tithe and offering. Those of you who are watching online via live stream, you can go to our website, wccmansfield.org, and click on the Take Action button at the bottom. If you're here in the service, you can go to the back of our bulletin and you can hit the QR code right here and it'll take you straight to that page and you can pay online with Apple Pay or uh, uh, Google Pay, however you want to pay that, you can do that there. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and come and worship the Lord in giving uh, this morning with your tithe and offering. Would you come and worship Him?
Would you stretch your hands this way as we pray the Lord's blessing upon this that has been brought to his house? Father God, in the name of Jesus, according to your word, God, we have brought the tithe and the offering into the house of the Lord, God. And Lord, we know, Father, that when we bring it out unto you out of obedience and out of worship, God, that you will bless and multiply it. God, and not only that, you will bless and multiply unto those who bring to your house and pour out a blessing that cannot be contained. And Father, we thank you for what you have done and the provisions you have given. And Lord, we are thanking you in advance for that which is to come in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we glorify and honor and bless your holy name. We sanctify this under your service. God, to reach around the world with this that has been brought to your house today in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. It, it is my uh, uh, honor to uh, introduce to you a man I've known for, well, since 1991, 92. It's been, a, that seems like yesterday to me, but then I look at the calendar and it's been a long time. <laughs> he, uh, Dr. Martin Taylor, um, was in South Louisiana pastoring one of our uh, premier churches in uh, South Louisiana at the time that Gina and I were appointed to our first pastorate at Savannah Branch. We were um, just a couple of miles from his church. Um, in fact, the road that went from my church to his church, they called Million Dollar Road because it, I think it cost around a million dollars to build. At least that's what I was told. And uh, I think he got the million dollar end and I got the beginning end. <laughs> but before that, I had known him because... His church hosted uh, the youth camp every year. They had a campground there, and they hosted the, the state. And I worked as a youth pastor when we were in Monroe, and I met him at that time. And even a, a, as a youth pastor, you know, when you're a youth minister and you're, you're at youth camp, it's one thing. When there are senior pastors there, it's a little different. And uh, Dr. Taylor was, uh, to my young self, an intimidating figure. And... Uh, uh, but he's, he was always kind and gracious and uh, good to uh, Gina and I. I remember when we were appointed to our first church that um, I had occasion or two to call and ask him a question uh, about something that was going on, about a district meeting that I, or a, a church conference that I needed to have or a church meeting, and you're supposed to get the approval from your district overseer, which he was. And uh, he was always kind and asked me, do, I, do you need any help? Do you need me to come and, and be there? He knew it was my first pastorate. And, and uh, he shared just a few things. I don't even know if he remembered them, but he shared a few things with me during that time that I have carried all of my ministry. And all of the, the time, I, I just remembered them and, and words of just simple words of encouragement. And I've always appreciated him over the years and watched him as he left there and went into uh, overseer work as state overseers, administrative bishop over different states, and then went on after that to pastor some of the uh, premier uh, premier church in Alabama, and uh, um, he's now serving the church as a world missions representative. Uh, he and his wife April do a lot of traveling. Um, I actually uh, kind of reacquainted with them uh, on my trip to Scotland, my missions trip a couple years ago to Scotland. They were there, and uh, um, I got to know April and, and re, reacquainted with uh, Brother Taylor. And I call him Brother Taylor. He is, it does have a doctorate, but to me, he's always Brother Taylor because he was my first district overseer. And so I appreciate them. And uh, we have been talking for probably a year and a half, two years about him coming here and just speaking to you. And I have shared with you uh, that he is one of the premier preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the church of God and preached camp meetings and state meetings and conferences and done all kinds of things. And I could go on and on, but I know you're ready to hear him as he presents the World Missions vision uh, for us. And our first Sunday each month is a World Vision or, or a World Missions emphasis. At the end of the service, we're going to have an offering where you can uh, give, and he's going to talk more about that to World Missions but I want you to make him and April welcome this morning as Dr. Taylor comes to minister to us. Would you just welcome him as he comes? Thank you. 
Great privilege and humbling honor to be with you today. I've so been looking forward to being with you, April and I, and we're so thrilled that we finally get that opportunity, like all of you. And my job, and I, I, as he said, I, I've served for 16 years as a bishop and, and uh, 25 years in the pastorate, and, and then uh, accepted the challenge by our, our church to move into world missions and begin to, my job is to tell the story, how the Church of God operates outside the United States and what we do and accomplish and uh, try to get you to be involved in it, give you that opportunity to be a part of what God is doing around the world. And wow, what a wonderful privilege it is and what a great honor and uh, so thrilled that I'm back on the road because uh, at the beginning of uh, March when uh, COVID struck and everything shut down, guess what? We shut down too. And um, no operations. Matter of fact, the executive offices were closed for a couple of months there in the middle of it when a lot of things were going on. And so uh, it's been quite a challenge. And I'll just be honest with you, I'm not a sit-around person. And I've watched all the television I want to watch. And I've, I've read more than I wanted to read. And um, uh, April and I have, uh, we're newlyweds, so to speak. We're only, uh, this November will be two years that uh, not three years this November is three years that we will have been married and uh, you know I, I discovered if you can if you can you know make that marriage happen in a COVID scenario when you're with each other 24 7 seven days a week you're doing okay and uh, so with God's help we're doing okay but uh, what a joy what a delight and what a privilege to be here my son-in-law is your state director of youth and Christian education uh, which means that his wife is my daughter, my oldest daughter, Jennifer, and she's also the daddy's girl, uh, by the way. And uh, the other two of my children say that she's the golden child. You know how that works. There's always one in a family. And um, But I'm, I'm delighted to be with him. I met Chad Fickett when he was about 15 years old up in the state of Maine when I later came, a few years later, became the state overseer there in the state of Maine. But um, he is a great man of God. But he's been talking about you. He's been telling what a great church this is and how much we're going to enjoy being with you. And truly, we've already enjoyed being with Pastor Kurt and Gina. And Gina, fantastic job. And uh, right songs, right choices. The goodness of the Lord. That song just does something to me every time I hear it. And thank you so much for singing it and sharing it. Uh, if you have your Bibles today, I want to take you to the Word of God in Mark's Gospel, Chapter 2. Chapter 2, and somebody's talking to me. I don't want that. Uh, it's a new app I haven't used, so this is a... There we go. I made him shut up, so... He, said, he says it better than me, but I want to do it, so... Amen. It's a very good story, and, and, and it talks about, and what I want to talk about today is, is talk about a church that cares or a caring church. It's important for us in this generation where we are today that we have that experience and we are, uh, we care about people. We really do. Uh, it means to, what does it mean to care for someone? Uh, you ask yourself the question today, are we a caring church? I think churches should continually ask themselves that. Uh, churches uh, sometimes, uh, histor hi uh, um, oh, wait, stop. Rewind, start over. I rewind like you did the tape while ago. All right, but, but, but researchers have told us that churches are not the friendliest environment to be in. Now, most churches, about 90% of churches believe they're a friendly church but not 90% of the people who attend there think it's a friendly church, especially visitors that come. 
So that's one thing we have to continually evaluate. And as a pastor, that's what I used to do in the sense of saying to my congregation, okay, now speak to someone near to you, or we'd take a time to make sure we welcome the visitors if we had them in the, in the audience, just to make sure that people knew. Because if you get someone to your church, you want to show them that you care about them individually, sincerely, and then that good things can happen. So let me tell you a story today. I'm not going to read all of it. Uh, all 12 verses. I'm just going to read a couple of them in Mark chapter uh, 2. And uh, there's a story here. I'll summarize the beginning of it, but I'm preaching from the whole scripture. Jesus had just completed a tour of the synagogues in the area and now returns to Capernaum. Quickly, word goes out that he's there. And soon the little house where he was is overfilling with people trying to hear him and see him. And among the crowd was a group of men who all of a sudden bring their handicapped friend to Jesus. Let me read that scripture in 4 and 5. And when they could not come near him, meaning Jesus, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. So they, they come to the church, they try to get in the building, they can't get in the building, and most people would have said, oh, well, I guess we'll try again later, or we'll come back some other time, but they did not. Instead, in the buildings of those of, of Jerusalem and that Capernaum, that area, would have had an outside stairwell that would have led you up to the roof of the building, which would have been a flat roof. And uh, so they would have climbed up there, and they began to tear open the roof itself, because they were intent on getting their friend to Jesus. Now, obviously, they were friends with him. The Bible says, obviously, they were people, four men in particular, that deeply cared about the man's brokenness. Ask yourself the question, how much do you need to care in order to do what they did? Because they had to work. That's important. They had to work to get their friend to Jesus. It just didn't happen. He just didn't show up. They went and got him. They brought him. They went up. They tore open the roof. And they let him down to the Lord. And the Lord said, they saw, they, they saw their faith. And he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Later on, we know, of course, he also tells them to get up and walk, and he does. But by the actions of these men, they give us the characteristics of a caring church and a caring people. And I want to talk about that today. Number one, they had genuine concern. They had genuine concern. Unselfishness is a word that we're not familiar with very much, but unselfishness was a characteristic that mark these men. Today, our world is filled with selfishness, self-centered, self-absorbed people. It seems we're always asking our leaders, what are you going to do for me and how much are you going to give me? It's always about me. I mean, I'm guilty, as we all are, of falling into that trap occasionally and allowing not thinking about other people, thinking about those around. And we've all felt that way this year. We've all gotten to the place, and we've prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, don't you care for us? We've gone through fits of depression at times from being cooped up with the same group all the time. Or, uh, you know, if you've got kids, I can imagine those of you who have children at home that you've had to teach them. My, my first wife taught our kids homeschool them for a couple of years, but I, I, I refused to do so. I, I said, no, I'm not doing that. I, uh-uh. You know, so I, there are people paid to do that, but, but there was a circumstances that was important for them, and they did that. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't imagine you, you mothers and fathers who, who have taken on that task of, 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 of taking care of your children, but not only just taking care of them and feeding them and clothing them and all that kind of thing, but most of the time they're shut up inside. And you're trying to keep up and trying to keep sanity going on. And you sometimes say, throw up your hands and say, God. What, what in the world? You know, you want to do the, the commercial many years ago that came out and said, Calgon, take me away. You remember that one? But yet in order to bring this man to Jesus, 
they had to deny themselves many of the blessings that others at the meeting were going to receive. Because it meant giving up their time. There's another thing. Giving up their time for someone who was broken and in need. Broken and in need. Giving up time. Being genuinely concerned. Caring. Because that was necessary. It meant caring enough to be inconvenienced. How many times someone either post on Facebook or some friend of ours tell us, oh, brother, uh, my so-and-so, my child, or my, my brother, or my aunt, or whatever, my uncle, they're sick, and would you pray for them? And I'll pray for them. Do you? How many times do we say, I'll pray for you? And we go on, and we mean to, but we forget it. What I have learned from me, because I get that a lot, is I've learned that I pray right then. As soon as I say I'm going to pray for them, I pray for them. But it's the understanding of inconvenience because sometimes it's not convenient or they address it at an inconvenient time. But it means caring enough to, to be inconvenienced, caring enough to go out of their way to help someone else. And the beauty of a church with genuine concern is its willingness to become involved without considering personal cost, without considering what does it cost me. That's, that's, the, that's the church that will make a difference in the world, and that's the church that will display themselves as a friendly, open, caring people that people will flood your doors to be a part of because everybody is looking for someone to care. Everyone is looking for someone who reaches out. I know the last church I pastored in, in Louisiana, I followed actually your bishop to that church, at one time, it was a large church, over a 1,000 people had fallen on hard times, and, and uh, your bishop came in and stabilized it and brought it up a level, and then we tried to carry it to another level and got to some uh, progress in it, and, and we started seeing people come into the church. And after a while, I would meet with them, and I would say to them, what caused you to come here? Because I had worked hard at it, honestly, I'll be honest with you. And I said, what, 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 what caused you to want to be in our church and I love their answer the answer said pastor I really can't say you know was it preaching was it singing it was well it was all those things but I just felt home when I got here I felt like this was where I was supposed to be now let me tell you something that's what the word of God teaching us that's what the God says to us and the understanding that there's an opportunity now, the second thing they understood is they only done, had genuine concern. They understood cooperation. They understood unity. It took all four of them to bring their friend to Jesus. Each man suddenly realizes the importance of the other. Not one of them could have done it by himself. It took all four of them. Success will only be achieved if every man came together to hold up his corner of the bed. Do you know, most ministry is about simply doing what we can. People worry about what ministry is. My son told me the story when he went to Lee and he was training and studying to be a youth pastor and later to become one. And uh, as he's talking to a friend of his who was also in class with him, whose dad was a pastor also, and, and he was talking about the, the fact of having to work at uh, Cracker Barrel to, to get enough money to be able to go to school and all those kind of things. And, and he said, this is not ministry. And all this stuff is going, he was just, you know, a young teenager rambling. And, and finally, my son stopped him and said, stop. Your dad almost obviously did not teach you and train you like mine did. My dad taught me that if we're called to preach, whatever we put our hand to is ministry. If that meant cleaning the toilets in the church or whether that meant cleaning the floors or that meant, you know, sweeping up trash or cutting the grass or trimming the shrubs, whatever it was, that was ministry. And so that's sometimes what we have forgotten. We began at some point when we brought in what we began to deem a professional clergy to where we began to categorize and then we brought in staff and we need all those things. I know I had all of those. I know you need them. But at the same time, it caused sometimes the people the real ministers of the church uh, to sit back and think, well, I'm not involved in ministry. I'm just here to enjoy and relax and enjoy the service. 
you are here to enjoy the service. But there's so much more because whatever we do, we are ministers. I try to tell people, do you know that you are a witness for the Lord, good or bad? You're an active witness or you're a passive witness. And it's okay sometimes to be a passive witness. It's just the fact that when you meet someone, you smile at them. It's a simple fact. If you're in a store, you're polite to the clerks. If you're in a, in a, in a restaurant, you're nice to the server. You give them a good tip. You don't give them the cheap, you know. I, I watch that all the time. I'm very cognizant of it. I never worked in the food industry. My kids never worked in the food industry, but, but I, I always pay attention to that and realize that you know, sometimes they mess up. Sometimes they have a bad day. As a matter of fact, one of the thrills of my life is every now and then when I'm in a restaurant like that, the Holy Spirit will allow me to minister to one of those people. And he usually does it through an offering. They won't even be my server, and they'll come by a couple of times, and the Holy Spirit will say, give them a piece of money and tell me how much to give them. And as I do it, I, I, come, they, I say, well, Lord, that's not my server. If they come back by and they stop, that was one beautiful young girl that one day came by, and she came by and stopped. And when she did, she was going to pour me some tea. Now, it wasn't her table, but God used it. And I said, here, I'm supposed to give you this. And she took it, put it in her pocket, went back to the back, came back out, and said, you can't do this. And I said, sure I can. She said, but that's too much money. She said, uh, she said, I'm not your server. I said, don't worry about my server. I'll take care of my server. But I said, God said to give that to you. She started tearing up. She goes back. And a few minutes later, she comes back out there, and she said, I got up this morning. My car wouldn't crank, and my battery's dead, and you gave me the money to buy a new battery. Whew, I got goosebumps right there. And that's when I say, oh, thank you, God, because I right by myself. There was nobody around me to show off to. I just simply said, oh, thank you, God, that I was a, a, a beginning of a passive witness, but I became an active witness. And I let her know I did that because the Holy Spirit told me to give it to you. You see, that's what we do. If we're sensitive, if we're aware, and it's about awareness, if we're aware that wherever we go, whatever we do, we're a witness that we are there and that, that, that we are a part of the ministry of the kingdom, and it's about doing what we can. In this case, failure was inevitable if any one of them had decided to do his own thing. How much more we can accomplish in the kingdom if we understand not just coming together, but working together. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 133. How good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You see, unity, according to Psalm 133, brings anointing, brings refreshing, brings blessing, and brings favor. And we all want that in our church. How much more can we accomplish if we understand all of us are important to the work of the kingdom? I had the great privilege and pleasure to go to churches sometimes. I pastored five churches in, my, in 25 years, and, and as I, I would go to some of them and they would be down, as, as we'd say in the, the world, business world, or whatever, they are down on their luck. Things were not going good. They, the, the church had fallen on hard times. And, and uh, inevitably, I'd have someone in the church, after being there a little while, say, Pastor, oh, Pastor, we've prayed for, it, for you to come along, or someone to come along to help us, and say, we're so thrilled that you're here. And, and, and what we would like, we, we, if, if God would just simply unify this church, then then. Good things can happen. I used to think to myself as a young preacher of the gospel, well, yes, true. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, help the church become in unity. Until I read the scriptures. And I read the scriptures, God doesn't bring unity. God doesn't do that. We do that. He said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It does not say how good and how pleasant it is for God to make us be in unity. But it's about us coming together. It's about the church being the church and unity. Then he does go on to say, however, if a church does or a people do come together, I will anoint you with a heavenly anointing. I will refresh you and bring times of refreshing. I will bless you and bring times of blessing. And you will have the favor of God on your house. Now, that's fantastic. That's outstanding. Because that's what God wants us to do. But we're all important. We, we sometimes think because we can't sing or we can't teach or we can't do this, we can't do that in the church that we're no good. 
And we're just a little peon sitting on a pew somewhere, a chair somewhere, just trying to do what I can. That's all you want. Do you know in Gideon's army, there was a 300 men who showed up and all they did is stood still? 300 men stood in their place? 300 men that God used to defeat the army of the enemy? 300 men circled the camp of 10,000? I don't know how many there were. 300 men... And they were the ones who agreed to show up. God wants everybody in their place. God just wants you to be there. I don't have anything. Yes, you do. You have a smile. You have an encouraging word. Hallelujah. And from doing that, we began to see the church grow increase in faith, increase in anointing, and God begins to bring us souls, which is what we're all about. A caring church is a unified church. Thirdly and finally, they believed Jesus was the answer. No, they believed Jesus was the only answer. The only answer. It's like the woman with the issue of blood. She had tried all the physicians and none of them could help her. She had tried all of them, and nobody could help her. It was only Jesus could change. And in this present world today, this pluralism, this world today where there's a God on every corner, where everybody has their own God and all that kind of baloney, there's not true. It does not work. The only thing that works is Jesus Christ. The only thing that makes a difference in you is Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things that's happening right now, when we, when we got into this scenario, the COVID, most of our, our pastors, local pastors, somewhere close to 40,000 pastors on the outside of the United States, they're primarily day workers. You know what that means? It means they work day by day. They go out to the market, they get a job, they go work, they get paid that day, and they go buy groceries or food for their family and to feed them. And, and they weren't working. The world shut down, people. And some of it is still shut down much more than we are. Indonesia is still right now. There is such rampant COVID going just raging everywhere because it's a very populated country. And so the world shut down. Well, we find out our, our pastors are starving and our director, Dr. Griffiths, sends out a plea and tells us to help send out a plea to our churches and pastors and say, can you help us with food? Can you send us an honorarium, so an honor of money that we can send out to them? And God blessed us. And this church responded in the middle of crisis, in the middle of trouble, in the middle of time. The churches were not having church. And we that more than $500,000 came in to World Missions just for that one project. And Amen. And, and this is what we were told. Dr. Griffiths was telling us this story just recently when he said that, that, that they began to send out, uh, the, the, the leaders would send out food packages and get them to the pastors, and they found out that they weren't keeping all of it. What they were doing was they were sharing with their neighbor. It became a point of evangelism. And so they would go to their neighbor and say, we have extra food, could you use some of it? The thing is, many of their neighbors were Muslim. And God has used that. We're seeing a revival in Muslim countries because of Christians who have simply shared a piece of bread. Oh, my God. That is ministry. That's the work of the kingdom. That's about people who are concerned and people who care and people who understand only Jesus is the answer for hope for the world itself. Can you say amen? amen. I get excited sometimes still. They could have complained how heavy the bed was or how big the guy was or how big the crowd was or there was a ball game to see this afternoon or we couldn't get him through the crowd. We just can't. Maybe next time. But they did not. They refused to quit. They refused to walk away. They refused to give up. And most miracles, someone said, are the result of someone who just wouldn't quit. Hmm. They cared. They cared. What I'm so thrilled about is they cared enough, and God cared for them the same way because he saw their faith. 
And he saw, said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And then later on, because the Sadducees and Pharisees sitting on the front row didn't like what was done. How does it work? Jesus can say, forgive them. Jesus said, just let you know I have that ability. Get up and walk. Take your bed and go home. Hallelujah. Somebody going out of their way so somebody else can be saved. Somebody sacrificing so that somebody else can be healed. Somebody ministering to someone that they'll never know so they can find Jesus Christ and meet in heaven together. That's what World Missions does. It is the most exciting place to be a part of. I think I've been in ministry. I don't. I, I personally, as I was an evangelist for five years, I was a pastor for twenty-five. I, I know all these things, and, and I love to see people get saved in the altar. And now we're we can't even touch people. You know, I'll be glad when all this baloney is over and we can move on and and get all this virus out of the way, or uh, or everybody gets it so it get over with it. You know. It's like the measles. I remember one of my, us, when my, there were four of us siblings, and one of them got uh, measles. My mother put two of us in, uh, in bed with the, the sick one. That was a mindset in those days. You know why? All of them get in, get it over with. We all got it. We got it over with. Didn't have to worry about it anymore. I know that's not the way you do that, but that's what they did. That was a long time ago. But, but, but it, it, we're at a place where we can't stop doing ministry, and World Missions does that. Uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, we moved into our 185th country of the world. According to some numbers, there's only 190 countries or 195 countries in the world. I did not realize that we would be part of an organization. I was part of an organization until I got here that, that actually is doing its best to make sure the gospel is preached to the whole world. I love that, that we sacrifice that. Our people go out of their way. We have people embedded in Iran. Well, I don't know their names, and nobody will let the, you know what their names are. We have people embedded in Iraq. We have people in every Muslim country, Saudi Arabia. We have people embedded in these countries that are winning souls daily. Winning souls daily. But you know, it takes a little bit of effort from us to make sure they get the job done. And I'm amazed and thrilled to have that opportunity. 185 countries, about 40,000 native pastors. We have about 500 full-time career missionaries out there. Who, who gave them up, and I'll introduce you to a couple of them in a few minutes, but I introduce you to one in particular who had, at an older age, when most people were retiring and settling down, they decided God had called them to Samoa, and so they went out, and they're out of, the, the, out of Missouri, and they went and sold their house, took all their, their retirement out of their, their, their accounts, they sold their, they had a motor home, they sold their motor home, they sold their cars, they gave up everything they could go, and got down to enough that they could put in a couple of boxes, and they went to Samoa. They're both in their 60s at least to start their missionary journey. I'm telling you, that tears my heart up. I'm a compassionate person, but that, that, I'm not that compassionate. I, I thank God. But when I hear a story like that, when I hear their story, I know them personally. I've met with them. I've talked with them. I know them personally. You guys helped them last year. They get to Samoa. They were supposed to have a car there. The car was broken down, wouldn't run. We got out, and I came to the state, and your pastor stepped on board with us, along with several other pastors. We were able to buy them a vehicle. They could get around to do their ministry. He said, that's the way it works. The money's not there, but it's here. And we worked to send that money there and get it there. When we have 120 Bible schools and universities around the world. We have uh, about 130 or 40 orphanages where little children that are abandoned and cast aside and and disrupted from their lives or are, are finding hope. My last church that I pastored, the Summerton Church in Alabama, we helped build an orphanage down in, uh, in uh, Pien de Men, Colombia. It's in the middle of war-torn, air, war-torn areas, the, just the, the cartel, the cocaine cartel area. Matter of fact, I've been down there two times, three times. 
And uh, you can only go in for a couple of hours. You can't stay overnight because of the corrupt rebel soldiers are in the hills. They're not going to mess with the children. But if you're a white person there, you know, they, they want you. They want you so much that they'll bring you in and set you up a house where they live. You'll be tied up and beaten, mistreated. You won't get any food. But they want you. That way they can contact your people and say, we want money. But there are people who are willing to go into that. And those children are being ministered to. We make that sacrifice so those children can be ministered to. We've got about 50 kids there. We've got so many of those around the world that's going on. They were just abandoned, thrown to the streets, and God has helped us. So you see, you have that opportunity. I talked to your pastor and found out that you're, you're doing a great job. Oh, I'm sorry. April, in my briefcase there, hand me that, that report um, just real quickly. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I feel a little bit fractured today. This is my first church back. I was a little nervous preaching today, I'm telling you. Uh, we talked about it, us, uh, us uh, uh, reps, there's three of us that, that cover the whole United States. All of us have uh, anywhere from 16 to 19 states that we all thank you, dear. We all travel to. Isn't she a good-looking woman? I, I tell you what, God has blessed me. My goodness, my goodness. Hallelujah. I can tell you what the Scripture says. It is not good for a man to be alone. He's right. I also was reading one day in Psalms when the, or Proverbs when the Scripture said that uh, a man who finds a wife finds a good thing and with him save her from God. I said, I believe God's wanting something. Tell me something here, you know. So after about uh, three years or so being single, I, uh, God put this woman in my life and praise the Lord for it. Uh, your church over the last, um, the last five years has given about $40,000 to Church God World Missions. That means in five years, 565 people have been saved out of this church. Amen. That means that about 113 are saved every year. That means that nine are saved monthly and two weekly. So every time you have church service here on Sunday morning, there are two people in the mission field being saved because of what you have done. Now that's exciting to me. And as I started to say earlier, I, I don't see the number of souls saved that I used to get. My report doesn't look real good when I turn it in to the, to the, to the, to the journal offices. But at the same time as I do that, I know that every time I, I'm helping win the souls of the world, and we look out there and we see every year a close to a million people that are saved around the world. There, do you know there are more members of the Church of God outside the United States than in it? There's over 6 million people outside the United States and just about just over a million inside. God has given us a place. And it all began, real quickly, let me tell you this, it all began with one retired Methodist pastor and one Bahamian who got together in a church service in the middle of Florida, neither one of them Church of God, even the, even the camp meeting was not a Church of God camp meeting, and they got filled with the Holy Ghost, Somehow or another, the general overseer that, at that time happened to be there. They met with him, and he commissioned them to go to the Bahamas. And this man gave up his Methodist pension, took his family, put them on a boat. They went across. The Bahamian went ahead of him to set up the territory. And from that one church that still exists today, Turtle Cay Church in, in Grand Bahamas, that church, we're now in 185 countries. God, through his mercy, allowed us to multiply. And the people of the church of God, now over a hundred years, over a hundred years, have been winning souls around the world. And I want you to be a part of that. Uh, the, the ushers have, or the elders have in their hands uh, uh, some faith promises. Now, don't panic on this. I am not asking for anybody to give me a pledge today. All right? Not anybody to give me a pledge. How many of you at the end of the year or the first of the year created what this world calls a resolution? Anybody ever doing resolutions? You did resolutions? Nobody? You learned your lesson, didn't you? Let me say it this way. How many of you have ever done a resolution in the past? And how many of us failed to 
resolutions, most of us. You know a resolution? I've learned that a resolution is a faith promise. A resolution is a faith promise. It's what we use on a regular basis to get people to understand a faith promise is a goal. It's a goal. It is say I'm moved by what I hear. I want to be involved by what I hear. I want to be involved in winning souls. Every $54 in change wins a soul. How do we know that? Because we calculate it from the monies that come into the World Missions Department. And what happens is we're winning souls around the world. We're changing countries. There are now countries in the Caribbean and in South America or Central America where the Church of God is the largest religious organization there. The Pentecostal message has become rampant in those areas. Other places, we're just right behind the Catholics because, of course, South America, founded by the Spanish, is a very Catholic area. But God's given us that opportunity. And what we want to do today, and I want to just introduce you to your missionaries. These are the missionaries that you support already. And I want to introduce you, and as you put each one up, just leave it there a second. Let me talk about that. If you would, they're going to give this to us. So this is Vince and Carrie Massengill. In 2013, they relocated Shara, United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. He serves as our regional education coordinator, as well as the principal of the Gilgal Bible Seminary. His primary focus is bringing the gospel of Christ to the Arab world through evangelism and through connecting with churches. He says, the heart of the Great Commission is not merely about lost people, but about providing the whole world with access to the gospel. 80% of the unreached, listen, 80% of the unreached people in the world live in the Middle East and North Africa. The Middle East and North Africa, 80%. Only by bringing the message of Christ to the unreached nations of the world can we finally complete the task by Christ to his church two millennia ago. There you see them, and you see their project number, 050069. Second is Dennis and Vanna Tanner. Dennis and Vanna have spent their life in the mission field. First with the Assemblies of God and in the last uh, dozen years or so with the Church of God. First of all, I think they were in the Congo and the uh, African area. And now they're in Scotland and uh, served for years as a state overseer of Scotland. Now they are, are, are area missionaries and they have celebrated this as a, as a focus of cross-cultural missionaries sharing and guiding the light of Scotland. As guardians of the light, the Tanner's vision remains constant. Reach the lost, disciple and train new Christians, develop leaders, plant churches among the displaced persons, provide and maintain a guiding light to help people find the safety of eternal life. 0650213, as you see, their project number. Your other, one of your other missionaries is Randall Paris. Randall Paris is the Africa Youth Ministry Coordinator. He has top, top priorities of training youth leaders, providing sources, resources, effective communication, building trust, uh, building relationships, developing financial sustainability. He says, I'm grateful for the faithful hand of God upon my life. I certainly don't deserve it. I don't have a clue what I'm doing, but God does. I like that. I like honesty, don't you? I don't have a clue what I'm doing, but God does. I'm grateful for open doors, the leading of the Spirit. My heart's full. The opportunity, motivation, and sin is clear. There are at least a half a billion living, breathing reasons to take action. What an amazing harvest opportunity. And you see, 102-9424. Jim and Mindy Weiss, this is the couple I talked to you about. They are missionaries to Samoa. Mindy and Jim share the vision and love for the people of Samoa. A team serving together with Mindy preaching and the one ordained. As Jim says, she does the talking. Jim and Mindy have served faithfully for years in local church. They have a servant's heart to go, to do, and to be where God tells them. They're in a season of transition. The call of God came about three years ago. She stepped down from a nursing career as an assistant professor, saying yes to the call. Jim recently retired to go with her. Jim and Mindy are servants, seeking intimacy with God with a passion to share the gospel. Mindy has experience with bringing the word to God's women's events, local church, and missions. 
It's called Living Grace, Living on Grace Ministry, 05-065-0950. Jim and Mindy are, uh, are brand new. They've only been there for about a year and a half now, and they're committed. They sold out and went. Uh, the last one I'm going to share with you is Ben and Diane Bustamante. Missionaries to Italy. Ben and Diane have been pioneer pastors for 18 years in Italy. The first they plant, city, they, the church they planted in the city of Milan. Then they began to plant churches all over Brescia, Mantova, Florence, Pisa, Biella, as well as many others. They're part of the leadership council of the Church of God in Italy. Diane, as a matter of fact, is from Lancaster, Texas. She grew up in Lancaster and found the Lord at the age of six. They both hold credentials with the Church of God. They want to be a part of this last day outpouring by evangelizing, equipping, and raising up leaders for the preparation of his soon coming. Project 0650070. That's your, that's your missionaries. What I'll do is just, can you, can you do it so you can loop those and just keep dropping them over? Because while I talk real quickly here, and I'm finishing up, uh, believe it or not, it's almost noon, I know that, and I'm going to get help. What I need you to do is participate. What I need you to do is be involved. Now, a pastor tells me that, and I praise the Lord, because not many churches do this, that every first Sunday, like today, is your mission Sunday, and you're promoting it especially, and that many of you give in your tithe envelopes when you put them in. Perfect. Perfect. Keep doing that. But what we would like for you to do, because pastor has a goal in mind for the church, what we would like for you to do is to fill out one of these, even if you don't put your address and email and that kind of thing. I would prefer that you do that, but if you don't, just put your name on it. And then what we will do is, and you put in what you're going to do over the next year. Figure it up. If it's $5 a week, if it's $10 a week, what it may be, then that's, you know, uh, five dollars. $10 a week is 52 I do the, the big ones. That's easier for me to do math on. You know, $10 is, is, is $520 for a year. And, it's amazing how quickly that grows up. We really ask everybody that can is to join us in three hundred. Three hundred dollars is about six bucks a week, and you can do that in your local church. You can do it by sending it into us. We'll send you the address. We'll send you an envelope every month. We'll let you know that how much you've been giving, and you'll have a running total for your tax purposes. But not only that, we will never send you a request. We'll not send you a request and beg you for money. We don't do that. Also, what we're asking today, we're asking for one year commitment. Actually, when you, one year that you set a goal, a faith promise is what we call it. God, if you bless me, this is what I'm going to do. If you don't bless me, I can't do it. Nobody's going to call you and say, oh, by the way, you know you haven't done your faith. Never. Never. You can do it that way. You can give it to the local church. You can give it into the World Missions Department. You can give it in by, by credit card. Uh, if you want to do a credit card, that's what I do because I'm on the road a lot. And so monthly, they, they, they charge my credit card with how much I tell them to. And, uh, and that way, it just keeps going on. Now, the thing I realized I forgot is I got busy this past year. We moved and, and found, got, bought a new house and all that kind of transition. My one year ran out. So if you do a credit card, it's only for one year. We only do it for a year at a time because you might change your mind. Other things may come up, whatever it may be. And so we do it in that process. So you can be a part of it. And all we're asking today is for you to participate, for you to sign up to be a part of it and set your goal that you would like to do for this local church. Now, if you don't want to say, I don't want to worry about trying to figure out a number and all those kind of things, then you simply say general missions. And that will come into the local church and then the, the elders of the church will designate it as it's needed because sometimes, just like with Jim and Mindy, the reason you have Jim and Mindy supporting is because there was a need a very serious need, and your churches and primarily the churches in Texas are the ones who made that happen and able to get them their car. So I, I, I knew that when you, if you did that, you may be interested again to keep them. And so and that's an addition to your normal giving. All the others you've been given to for years. All the others you've been given to for years. And so uh, you now have them. And Pastor, I'm going to say, every first Sunday, let it run again. He's downloaded. He's got it. Let it run. Let the people see who they are. We'll try to get you to get updates from them, maybe a little video here and there to get updates from them, and we can find out what's going on in their territory, okay? So I want you to be involved. I want you to participate. I want you to fill out the faith promise right now while you have the opportunity, just before we click over to the noon hour, and I have to quit, okay? On the right-hand side, let me explain to you real quickly. This is the information side. 
make sure you put the name of your church on here because your church gets credit on the international level for their giving. And uh, we make sure they get that. On this upper, there's an oblong box at the very top. That's if you're going to give an offering today. You may want to say, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do the um, $10 a week. That's $521. I'm going to write you a check today. Fine. That's just, or use a credit card. That's fine. Then put it in here. Put it that you're going to do it in here. Uh, if you're going to, a one-time gift, a cash offering, whatever it be, write it in that oblong box so we know how to separate things out when we get back in the back. If you want to do uh, monthly or weekly, then I encourage you to fill out the next box, and it tells you you can make a choice. It says, I'm going to give, my faith promise amount is, and I'll give it weekly, monthly, annually. I'm renewing one already. And then at the bottom of it, it's credit card information. If you want to use your credit card, trust me, we have one lady. This is her job. She comes in every, she only comes in the afternoon. She comes in every afternoon, and she works every day in order to, uh, to make these happen. So it's very secure. We've never had a problem. Never in the years we've been doing this have we had a problem with anybody's credit card being used or messed up, okay? So uh, join in, participate, be a part of it. Everybody can do something. Everybody can sacrifice a little. We're not asking anybody to do a lot. We're not asking anybody to do a fantastic. You can. I was at one church, and a lady gave $10,000. I went to the pastor, and I said, is this, not, is this a kid who's trying to make fun of me? He said, oh, no, no, that, that's a real person, and she can do it. I said, Thank you, Jesus. So if anybody's here today and God moves on you in the last few minutes, he's moved on you to do 10,000, you write that down. Amen. Me and pastor are going to shout all afternoon. So This is fun. It really is. I know it takes a little bit of your time. And I thank you so much for giving that time. I, I'll tell you what we'll do is if pastor, because, you know, I know how he is. He's just, he may have learned this from me, is guard your pulpit. You know, don't bring every Tom, Dick, and Harry around that wants to preach because most of them can't and aren't qualified to. But I appreciate it because I know that in this era we're living in, especially with COVID, you, you probably haven't had a lot of personal services going on. And even before that, most churches today, I don't know if yours does, doesn't have night services. Go have Sunday night services. That whittles that down to about 52 services. You take out holidays when you may not have one or holidays that are special events. Maybe you got a children's group or whatever doing it. All of a sudden, you whittle that down to about 40-something days. The pastor knows he's got to be in the pulpit. And I'm so grateful. I don't take this lightly because I was a pastor and overseer. I know. I'm so grateful for you as a church body. And I'm even more grateful for your pastor and wife for their allowing me to be here today and to share with you. And uh, whatever you do, you do. All right? No one's going to, as my dad used to use that terminology, no one's going to done you for your, uh, for your, your, your not giving. Uh, we're going to pray for you. Matter of fact, there's a place on there for prayer requests. Make sure you do that. We have a group of people that receive these, and they pray over them. That's not just a, a, a tool to get you to write something down. So we ask you to participate. If you don't want to fill one out, don't fill it out. We're just looking for a goal. We're looking to be able to work towards something, and we hope that you will participate and help us do that. When you get finished, when you get finished, if you didn't read it closely, that white piece of paper in front, you know, that, that where it says becoming a part, that white one, you, you leave that alone, and, uh, and you take that white one on the back. The hard copy on the back is a it's a hard, a little heavier stock paper. Tear that one off. That's your record. Okay. And the the yellow will be the church's record. The white one I'll take with me. And we do that because that's the most legible numbers and signatures, so that we make sure we do things right. We don't want well. Does that a is that a thousand or is that a hundred? You know. I'd probably say, oh, just put it down for a thousand. No, 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 we wouldn't do that. My, our ladies don't do that. Our ladies are very particular. Our secretaries, they're fantastic. They've been working there for years and they love God. They love the Church of God. They love world missions. Some of them have given their life to Church of God World Missions, helping you do something you want to do for the kingdom. So, again, thank you so much. You know, I, I sense I, I, I sensed a presence. When I was uh, was standing over there earlier today, 
your, your singing is anointed. It's worshipful. I, I go sometimes to a place and I'm almost embarrassed because it's a show. It's just simply being on. And, and that bothers me as a pastor. But your church, your pastor, I've known him for years. We got separated from Louisiana. And I don't know where, I think he went back out here. Maybe it was out here he came to. I went all the way up to Maine. Trust me, nobody came to see me up there. I saw last week they had two feet of snow in one day. Fall, I've been in that. I've seen five feet of snow on the ground at one time. I've seen ten feet of snow in a season. Uh, nobody came to see us. Nobody on the executive committee didn't just fly by and say, I want to go see Martin. No. Nope, 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 nope. But it's so great to be reacquainted, reconnected, and um, I thank God for this opportunity. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, if pastor wants me to, I'll come back and we'll do, I should, I should tell you first, okay. We do a couple, uh, we do a, a Sunday and a Sunday night, a special service, a revival day. And we'll do that. I love to be an evangelist and preach and we'll get past COVID so we can pray for folks. I like to minister to people. The Lord uses me with gifts of ministry, and I want to use those again. Uh, by the way, April has about just five or six copies of this book called The Miracles of Missions. This is written by Terrell Brinson, who is one of our missions reps. He's served over 20 years in world missions, traveling the world and the states, talking about it and meeting the people on the mission field. What he has done is compiled stories of missionary experiences and children's stories and, and, and church stories around the world. And he's compiled them into this. It just recently came out. If you would like one of those, I can tell you, you can't put it down once you start reading it. I took it and went home and started reading it. I'm a fast reader anyway, but I read it in about an hour and a half. And, and you can read it quickly. It's not long, but uh, it tells you, it'll excite you. It'll, it'll stir your engine. It'll make you want to come back next week and say, Pastor, I want to give some more money to missions. But, uh, but uh, if you would like to have one, April has them. Uh, they're $10 each, pays only for the printing, and anything over that comes back to World Missions. Terrell is not getting any money off of this. So it goes back to pay for the books, and then everything else goes to World Missions, and we appreciate that so very much. So God bless you today. Pastor, come if you would, please, and we're going to receive this offering. Are they going to bring it up? You're going to bring that offering up in a minute. Pastor's going to come and pray over it, share your share his heart with you, and and I'm out of your way. Okay, God bless you so much. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We appreciate it. As, as uh, Elder Bill brings the <clears throat> offering plates uh, up here, I'm going to ask Pastor David if you would go to the back and get one of the books. Um, and we'll talk about that before we ask you to come. What you bring in this offering, 100% goes to World Missions. Uh, you also bring your uh, faith promise, faith pledge, if you filled one of those out. If you didn't fill one out, leave it on the, the, the seat, and we'll collect those and get them back to uh, uh, Dr. Martin, Dr. Taylor. La a couple weeks ago, thank you, a couple of weeks ago, we... Uh, decided to do uh, offer to you our devotion. We had about uh, 30 of you sign up for these books. Um, the Pleasure of His Company by Dutch Sheets. We got those in. Uh, I read the first chapter. Um, there's 30 chapters. Where what we're asking is you read a chapter a week, a day, excuse me, a chapter a day. And we're going to be posting on Facebook starting tomorrow Chapter 1, as a reminder, what you should read and a little snippet. But I'm going to give you a little snippet about chapter 1. Because he talks in here in this devotion about um, God does, is not looking for worship. I want you to hear that. God is not looking for worship. He's looking for worshipers. Because he's looking for that relationship. And we, uh, again, we had 30 of you, 28 or 30 of you sign up for these. They were, we told you they were $12 because that was what they uh, gave us as the cost. When we went and ordered them, they gave, it, gave us a church discount. So they are now $10 a book. We've had a couple already pay online. If you want a refund of the $2, we can get that to you, or you can just make it a donation. But if you'll see 
uh, Sister Denise is the treasurer. She can, uh, if you want that back, she can get the, that to you. Um, and Gina is at the back with your books in a bag. You do have to pay before you take one. Amen. We're not accepting faith promises for the books. <laughs> We're accepting cash. Uh, you check or you can go online and pay at the table. But before you leave with the book, you do have to pay. We do have some extra ones. They are, I think, about five extra ones. If you want one, first come, first serve. When we run out, we are not ordering another order because we just can't do that. You can get them on Amazon if you don't get one today. Um, but you can do that at the back. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to pray over our world missions offering. And then we're going to ask you to come and worship the Lord. Again, with your faith promise, or you can, you can go online today. Um, and our goal, as we said it at our church meeting, um, was 10,000 this year. Uh, we're, we're shooting for 15, hoping to get 10. Um, I think Brother Roe has left. Uh, we also support him. He, he is not a, a part of the Church of God missions department, but we support him uh, as well. So well, we support a lot of these. And I will say, Jim and Mindy Weiss, Mindy and Jim Weiss, that you saw their picture, they were members of our church in Springfield before we came here. And I would like to take credit for kind of getting them on the road. I cannot. Gina had more to do with Mindy came and talked to her, and Gina really encouraged her. Uh, she she shared with Gina her heart, and uh, Gina said, "You need to get credentialed." And I helped them. We helped them get credentialed, and then they we came here, and they subsequently went into the mission field. So, I want you to bow your head, and we're going to pray. I believe God will speak to you in what to give, not just today, but throughout this year, because God blesses those who reach out in the mission field for lost souls. Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you and we praise you, God, for your goodness and your mercy, for your loving kindness. Lord, we pray, Father, Lord, that you would take what is given today and what is promised today or pledged today, God, as you open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, God, that we would extend that to the to world missions and to the mission field, God, to reach around the world with a harvest of souls for your kingdom, for your glory. Bless this those that bring bless those that give bless this that is given thank you god for this a fresh word that was given this morning and the encouragement we give you glory and honor and praise in jesus name and the church said amen, amen. would you come and worship god with your giving this morning uh, for world missions and don't forget you are dismissed don't forget tuesday prayer at seven here in the sanctuary wednesday night um uh, I'll be uh, speaking in here. We have classes for our youth and our young adults, and we're preparing to start our classes for our children in March. God bless you. Go with God.